hear me back there in the back? I don't necessarily want to use the mic if I don't have to. Before I get started, I, I want to apologize to you because what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning isn't the best topic, okay? But it's something that's important that uh, myself, Officer Tucker, the people across the street want to make sure that we relate to you. Um, we would have liked to do it earlier in the year, but we just didn't have time. Uh, we have gotten around to all the other schools. Some of you have seen part of this when you came through your classrooms earlier in the year. We talked a little bit about uh, violent intruder, active shooter with the classrooms. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is going to kind of add on to that, all right? What I want you to understand is that this isn't in policy, it's not in effect right now, but this is where we're, we're headed towards um, with our own police department, with the, with the powers of be across the street. We're, we're gearing towards this idea of how we're going to respond to an active shooter. Um, Officer Tucker is actually, how many of you have heard of ALICE training? Anybody in here? It's the active shooter uh, response school. O Officer Tucker is there, he was there yesterday and today. Uh, I talked to him last night. Uh, the training is incredible. And so that's what we want to roll out to you in the future and how we're going to train in the future. And today is going to be a little bit of an introduction just to kind of get thoughts in your head of where we're going and how you can respond uh, if there's a violent intruder or a uh, active shooter in the school. Some of the other things we're going to cover, I'm going to talk briefly about the triad and what a, what a school resource officer slash police officer in a school looks like. We're going to talk about traffic. Uh, that's going to be real brief. Most of you have probably heard a lot about that already. We're going to talk briefly about DCS reporting and how the laws changed on July 1st, which I'm sure all of you have heard that too and, and have some idea of what your responsibilities are. We're going to talk about how safety is our respons everybody's responsibility. It can't just be me or Officer Tucker's. We're going to talk about training, and then we're going to talk a lot about the active shooter, violent intruder stuff. So what is our role? Officer Tucker's role and my role here in the school. Well, the whole idea that NASRO, the National Association of School Resource Officers, puts out is that uh, we have three roles in the school, okay? We're gonna be a law counselor, all right? So a lot of times we have kids come down to our office and ask us questions, whether that's something that's going on at home, um, in their personal life, or maybe they got a ticket or something like that. They just come down, they ask questions, and we're there to talk them through um, what their options are. Okay, we're also law educators. Kind of what I'm doing this morning. I'm going to get up in front of you and talk to you about uh, active shooter. I'm going to talk to you about the DCS, the new DCS law. Okay, we're going to educate not only students, but staff, faculty, and everybody throughout the uh, district about the law. And then finally, we're police officers. Okay, you all know that. Anytime there's a crime that happens on Concord schools, uh, we're the ones that respond now, okay? We don't call the sheriff's department anymore, um, whether it's off-duty or whatever, you know, 24-7, we are the police officers for Concord Community Schools. One of the things we were tasked with early on uh, last May is the idea of proactive policing, okay? How are we going to make the district a safer place uh, for everybody, whether that's visitors, uh, you guys as staff or students. Uh, I'm not going to read you the definition of proactive policing. It's pretty simple. But the idea is, you know, out on the streets, it's, it's hard to be proactive because a lot of times you're responding to calls, right? Uh, you guys get home today, your house has been broken into, you're going to call the sheriff's department or the city police, they're going to respond out. All right, that's reactive policing, that's not proactive policing. It's, it's a little bit easier to be proactive in the situation that Officer Tucker and I find ourselves in now, in that you know we can get into the lives of these kids, we can uh, be in front of classrooms, we can be in front of them in the gym like we were earlier this year, uh, we can get out, we can run traffic, and we can educate them. Okay, so one of the easiest ways to be proactive in policing, and this is where normal police departments are proactive, is doing what? You all hate to get what? Stopped by the police, right? Okay. You hate to get, see those lights and sirens behind you, all right? But that's the easiest way to be proactive. And so we started talking about it, and we came up with this idea of, okay, how can we uh, educate the students, right? So we, we went to the school board. Well, we first started with Mr. Tahara and Mr. Trout. We go to the school board, and we say one of the easiest ways for us to be proactive is to actually be, be able to enforce traffic law on private property. 
all right? The Elkhart County Sheriff's Department cannot make traffic stops on private property, okay? Because there's no laws in place, there's no ordinances in place. So we created this chart. You're gonna see up here, the big difference is what? Cost, right? We're not trying to hammer kids with hundreds of dollars of tickets. What we're trying to do is educate kids on how to drive safely, all right? How many times have you been out in the parking lot and you see a kid go flying like across the parking places while there's cars and kids walking. Everybody in here has seen that at least once, right? Okay, how many of you have seen a kid go 70 miles an hour down Baseball Road? All right, maybe not 70, that might be a little extreme, but they fly down Baseball Road, right? So, I don't know what happened, Gay. <laughs> so, what we decided to do was come up with these things. Okay, the first time we stop kids, we're not gonna be writing them a $10 ticket. The, the reality is probably maybe even the second time, all right? But there's gotta be some force behind it, right? We can't just every time we stop them, give them a warning. Okay, so we're gonna give them a $10 ticket, $20. And if it continues to be the same kid over and over and over again, all right, we are gonna end up eventually take away their driving privileges and tell them they can't drive to school anymore. Uh, because they're a danger not only to the community but to themselves. Does that make sense? Any questions on that before I move on? I don't want to spend too much time on that. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about, maybe. Is the DCS reporting. All right. As a, how many of you know as of July 1st the law changed? Okay, and before you get all like worked up about it, all right, it, it's, it's not a whole lot different than what it was before, okay, except for the fact that instead of you as a teacher coming down to the office or going to the counselor or coming to me, well, take me out of that because technically you could come to me, but instead of going to the counselor or coming down to the office and talking to one of the principals or administrators, now you have the sole responsibility to report to DCS. Okay, it is your responsibility. Uh, one of the big reasons that is, is because you have all the information and we want to get it there in a timely manner. Okay, the state wants to get it there in a timely manner. I could go over case law of where it turned really bad and people lost their jobs, school districts are getting sued because they sat on information for a day or two and it just turned out really bad. Okay, so what you need to know is if you have any reason to believe Okay, it, this doesn't mean you have to have proof. It's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It is any reason to believe that there is some kind of abuse or neglect in the home, you need to report that to DCS. All right, if you're in the middle of a class, okay, you could call down to the office, say, hey, I gotta make a phone call, and we will get somebody to cover your class for a few minutes to make that phone call. Okay, you see the DCS number is up there. I'm sure we can send this out. Did you all get an email with the DCS number and this Google form? It's, it's on the resource page, okay? So the DCS number's there. There's also an email. I, if you email, I would call. I wouldn't recommend emailing. We all know how that works sometimes, okay? I would recommend calling. And then this form, if you click on this, um, it pops up and it gives you basically everything DCS is going to ask you. All right, it also gives you a spot where you can get the DCS worker's name and you can get their case number and then you can put in there what they're going to do with it. Sometimes they'll tell you on the phone, we're going to screen this out. Okay, sometimes they're going to say we're going to refer this for assessment and sometimes they'll say we're sending somebody out right now to talk to this kid. Okay, but the number one thing you need to know as of July 1st is you are responsible to report it. Okay, and that's the message we want to send this morning. Any questions about that? All right. Let's get to the fun stuff. You see in this picture, right, we talked about how safety, at the beginning I said safety is not just my responsibility or Officer Tucker's responsibility. This lineman here is going down the road and it's not his job to take this tree branch out of the road, so he goes out and around it and now we have a faulty line. Okay, wouldn't you be mad if some officer pulled you over for driving all over the fog line and that was the fog line? We're gonna watch a quick video here. 
Some of you, many of you have probably seen this before. If the sound doesn't work, it's not a big deal. She asks him if he's bored. Aw. How many of you have seen that before? Well, most of you, right? But it's the reality is that Officer Tucker and I aren't in the classroom, okay? Um, the administration isn't in the classroom, but all of you are in the classroom and you see these kids, right? And hopefully we never have to deal with something like this, all right? But we have to be prepared for it, right? And you guys are the eyes. I mean, that's, that's the truth, is that you guys are the eyes, and you are probably going to see signs way before Officer Tucker, myself, or the administration see signs that this might be one of our students. Okay, how many of you heard about what happened at Penn High School yesterday? All right, Penn High School, most of St. Joe County, or Mishawaka, John Young, they were all on lockdown yesterday uh, because they were tipped off. In this case, I think it was a parent. I don't know a lot of details, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But they were tipped off that there were some guns missing from a home. Okay, a student that was a little uh, upset and so the schools go on lockdown, they end up getting a gun out of a bag of a middle schooler at John Young Middle School yesterday. All right, all because somebody, in this case a parent, seen the signs, but reported it, okay? You might be the one to see the signs. All right, you might think it's something little. All right, it might be a kid drawing a picture on a piece of notebook paper, you know, shooting up somebody. All right, but that's a sign. 
All right, and our goal is to be able to intervene into those kids' lives and get them the help they need before it escalates to somebody bringing a gun to school. What's the training gonna look like, okay? This is one form of training this morning, right? I'm getting up in front of you, I'm talking to you about it, but we can't do that all the time. So we were talking about training and what we want it to look like, and we want to give scenarios out to you guys, whether um, it's in your meetings, your prep period workshops sometimes, or even more importantly, in bonus, okay? At some point, you're gonna get this training scenario that we want you to talk through with your students, all right? We want you to be able to talk through with your students that, hey, what happens if there's an active shooter right now? What do we do? Okay, and we're gonna give you these tabletop discussions to walk through, and Officer Tucker and I will pop into classrooms and talk with you guys about that with your students, but we want to be able to have our students prepared just as much as we have you guys prepared as well. So this is kind of an example of what you would get that you could talk through with your students. Here's a definition of an active shooter. I think we all probably understand the definition of an active shooter and know what that is. If you don't take anything else away from what I say this morning, this is what I want you to take away. Okay, this is what we're preaching. This is why we're spending money to go to Alice. All right, and that's that we're a survivor. Okay, through Officer Tucker and my training, all right, through a lot of training that some of you in this, in this room may have had, uh, whether it's military or whatever, we're survivors, okay? They preach that to you in the police academy, all right? They really preach that to me through SWAT training, that no matter what happens, I am going to be a survivor, okay? You're out, when we were out on the street, you know, on a traffic stop, it doesn't matter how big that guy is, okay? All of us coaches in this room, we always tell our players, it doesn't matter how big that guy is, okay? How tall that guy is, how tall that girl is, whatever it is. I am going to win the fight, right? Okay, and that's what we're preaching to you guys now, is that the days of, and I'm going to show you a picture here in a second, the days of crouching in a corner, okay, Virginia Tech, Everybody remembers that, right? I have a picture from Virginia Tech on this slideshow that everybody, because there's no active shooter training in college, right? So everybody had been trained at Virginia Tech in their high schools. And what were they trained to do? Huddle up in a corner, all right? Turn the lights out, huddle up in a corner, and hope for the best. And in those classrooms that they huddled up in a corner in Virginia Tech, and they hid away from the shooter, those were the classrooms that had the most fatalities. Okay, there was a uh, guy that had survived the Holocaust, was a professor in one of those classrooms, and he came up with a plan, all right? He started shoving people out the, not shoving them, helping them out the window, okay, to help them escape. In his classroom, I believe two people died out of the like 20 that were in there. All right, this is a picture. This was taken on somebody's cell phone during Virginia Tech. All right, notice how they're huddled up. Here's the exact opposite of huddling up or crouching down, and here's somebody who decides they're gonna fight. You're not gonna hear it, but there's about six gunshots that go off here. This guy here, he's upset. Um, he's shooting at his lawyer, okay, on the street in, in California. What's the lawyer doing? Is he just crouching down, hoping he doesn't get hit? What's he doing? He's moving back and forth, right? Moving back and forth. The guy fires his six rounds, okay, doesn't hit him once. We end up, <clears throat> the police end up tackling him. There was a study done by NYPD, and this is kind of embarrassing for us cops, but cops only hit their target like 18% of the time, right? Active shooters, anybody have a guess? Somebody throw a number out how, how accurate they are. It's like 75 plus percent of the time an active shooter hits their target. Why is that? Because when an active shooter comes in, nobody's moving. Everybody's sitting still, and they become a victim. Why do the police, 
Why are they 18% of the time? Because the bad guy is usually moving, right? He doesn't crouch down, he moves. <clears throat> Give us a few seconds. I don't know, Matt, it says it can't connect. I'm going to skip ahead, uh, and then we'll come back to this. Oh, hold on. It won't let me. You have to, to go click on it. I got it. Oh, boy. Oh, my. There we go. So what's your response supposed to look like, okay? And I gotta speed up because I'm taking Rob Miller's time now. Uh, your response, number one, if, and we're not talking just an active shooter, understand this could be somebody that walks in with a baseball bat, a hammer, an angry parent with a hammer coming through the front door, something like that, okay? It's a violent intruder slash active shooter. You need to notify somebody, all right? Rob's gonna talk about being able to dial 611 on your phones in your classrooms, all right? And I'll, I won't take his thunder, but that's a good option. The other option is put out a page, all right? You could call a lockdown from your room if somebody's walking in with a hammer, okay? That'd probably be a good idea. Don't call me, don't call Greg, all right? You can make that call if somebody's got a gun or a hammer or something like that, and they're walking through our hallways and they look angry, okay? You're going to lock down, you're going to inform. We need a description, all right? what he's wearing, okay, white male, blue jeans, red shirt, baseball hat, and he's got a hammer in his hand, and he's swinging at people, okay? Fight. If, if we lock down and somebody comes into your classroom, fight. There's a Carmel teacher who does a food drive every year, okay? Kids bring in cans of canned goods. You know what they do with those canned goods? They keep some of them, one for each student. So if somebody ever gets into the classroom, they're going to throw these canned goods at the bad guy. That's a way to fight. It's better than huddling up in a corner. If you can evacuate, evacuate. Okay, we're going to work in the future on reunification. If you get up outside of the building, where are we going to meet back up? Okay, how are we going to get the kids out of here? We're, gonna, we're putting a plan together, all right, that hopefully will be one of the best in the state on how to reunify if something like this happens. The bottom line is run if there's a clear path to safety, hide if you can't, and if the last option is to fight, we want you to fight instead of just sit there. Okay, what are we going to look like? Why do we talk about this? Because I want you guys to be prepared. Okay, we're going to come in, we're going to be in full, we'll have our vest on, we're going to have rifles, okay, the, the bottom line is in an extreme event, the county's going to be coming, the city's going to be coming, uh, anybody married to a state trooper in here, or have state trooper in their family, I always joke around about how you never see those guys, okay, but in the event that there's like something serious, there's like 30 of them that all of a sudden show up, okay, they, they love the high drama stuff, so they'll be here. All right, they're going to be tacked out, everybody in full SWAT gear. That's what it's going to look like, okay? Unfortunately, we've all seen footage from Vegas, right? Okay, and you've seen what some of those guys look like. That's what we will look like in the event of a violent intruder. <clears throat> we will use deadly force. The bottom line is that is our job, okay? It's nothing we ever want to do, but it's something we're prepared to do to save the lives of staff, students, and anybody else that's an innocent person in the building. Okay, this is the one that alarms a lot of people. We will bypass the injured. Okay, the reason being is the bottom line is if we don't go stop the threat, there's going to be more injured. Okay, we will tend to the injured, but we got to stop the threat first. We'll notify staff when it's safe. We'll let you guys know when it's safe, and we will evacu help evacuate and get everybody out of here. Don't touch anything. 
Okay, some people when stuff like this happens, like it's just natural to want to like clean up and get rid of it as fast as possible. It's now a crime scene. All right. The bottom line is if we're involved in stopping the threat, the state police are now in charge of the scene. Okay, so they are going to tech the entire school um, and we need to preserve that, that crime scene. Okay, I know this isn't happy things to think about. All right. But what I want you to take away from it is we are preparing in the unlikely event that something like this happens. We want you to know that we have a plan and that we're spending a lot of time, a lot of money on this plan to make sure that you guys are safe and to make sure that our students are safe. All right. Because we want to be prepared if it does happen. Does anybody have any questions for me? If you think of something, feel free to email me, stop by my office, and we can talk through it. Rob, 